All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for coming out here and joining us tonight. <laughs> the terrific audience. No, seriously, thank you. Um, as much of it has been an honor for me and a privilege and a pleasure to work with Steve in the studio. I mean, a guy who's been in my record collection for 40 years is now working in our studio. It's kind of, well, I just don't know what to say. <laughs> But uh, besides that, it's an even greater privilege and honor to introduce him here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Steve Katz. Uh, whatever 
this. And my mother and my father is wearing a wife beater. <laughs> and that little thing back there that looks like a television is actually my kid brother. <laughs> he used to watch uh, the, the Friday night fights on that uh, little, little TV. I remember when Stalin died, actually, in the bullet. We moved to uh, Schenectady, uh, New York, when I was a kid, and uh, I used to sing at uh, weddings and different functions around uh, around the town. And uh, the trio that was in doing most of the work there was called the Earl Pudney Trio, and that was Earl on the left. And uh, Earl did all of the uh, the uh, local TV work and stuff, and and. Uh, he was like the guy. If you wanted a piano player, you wanted Earl's trio, Earl was the guy. The problem was when, when Earl had to turn his head real quickly, if he had a cue you or something, his toupee went flying across the room. <laughs> then I was 15, I think. Okay, this is, okay, so, uh, when I was in school, I went to this, uh, school that I didn't like too much called Mineola High School in Long Island and uh, and I picked up the guitar and uh, started and started uh, playing and there's I was I was a uh, part of uh, journalism I joined journalism class and basically the school was either either uh, either jocks or hoods and I had a be I was like somewhere in the middle I was like the bohemian that just you know, moved into town. And um, so somehow I got to get along with everybody. And the way I did it was I got a column in the school newspaper and blackmailed everybody. <laughs> and then I would go into the village, Greenwich Village, at night whenever I could. And the village was magnificent then. It was like 1961, 62. And I would go in and, uh, or 1960 even. I would go in and hang out on McDougal Street. McDougal Street had uh, like three storefronts that, that I spent so much time in. One was the Folklore Center that was owned by uh, Israel Young. And uh, there's a picture of Izzy in the Folklore Center. Izzy just died a couple months ago. And um, the Folklore Center was where everybody hung out. And all the folk music people hung out there, and they used to sell uh, bro uh, broadside magazines and broadside records. And you know, you'd walk in in the afternoon, and, and Bob Dylan or Phil Oaks would be sitting there playing. You know, and, um, and they also used to have guitars that were they rent or sell. And I rented a guitar, and um, uh, I took it home, and I. I thought that, yeah, I got myself some resin, I don't know why, but I thought that you're supposed to because the violin players use resin, well, this is, you know, it's a fretboard, right? So I put resin on my guitar and uh, I couldn't move my fingers. I said, this is a weird instrument, you know, so. So uh, there I was at the, uh, in Greenwich Village and trying to play guitar and I finally went down to the Gaslight Cafe um, and then I, I was just stuck learning uh, or listening to people to guess like like Tom Paxton and Jack Elliott, and especially this guy, not that guy, <laughs> that's the Gaslight, and it says Dave Van Ron, and I would go there, and uh, Dave was uh, the the master of ceremonies for so much of the the, uh, the hootenannies down there, and I just loved what Dave was doing, and I asked him if he gave lessons, and uh, he said yes, I I will give you lessons. Uh, parentheses bubble over his head. I really don't want to, kid, but. But in those days, uh, you know, when, when you hung out at, at the gasway, the McDougal Street was very, it was like in between the beatnik and uh, the hippie thing. Um, you know, the beatnik thing was sort of over, but you still had these coffee shops. You know, you'd walk down McDougal Street and smell um, espresso and uh, you know, just all kinds of uh, 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 Galois cigarettes and stuff like that. Those are the scents, Galois or Vuitton. Yes, and uh, 
we have a French person here too. <laughs> Want to do it? Um, anyway, so uh, we would, we, you, you would have those sense when you walk down the street, you know. And, but things started changing a little bit, and uh, and, uh, and the coffee shops became where they were like uh, palaces of, of people doing poetry and stuff like that. They started changing to rock and roll. But before that, I was going up to Dave's on West 15th Street, and I took lessons from Dave for like two and a half years. Dave was a wonderful person, but he was also very grumpy most of the time, and uh, he was like six foot two, and and uh, he was angry at me all the time because uh, I, I never had my lesson perfect. And, and it just worked me really hard. He was a socialist, actually. He's a wobbly. Um, and at that time, there were very few wobblies, you know, but, uh, but it was sort of like a communist international workers of the world. I used to go to meetings with Dave and Terry. Terry was Dave's wife. Anyway, Dave is known for um, certain, I'm gonna play a song that's really Dave is sort of known for. Uh, he, he was, it, it was taught to him by Len Chandler, and uh, it's, it's, it's an old, you, you've heard of the song before, especially if you've seen Inside Lou and Davis, which actually had nothing to do with Dave at all. But, um, it's uh, based on a children's ring game where kids would gather in a circle and when I go by Baltimore, got no carpet on my floor. And uh, it sort of became one of Dave's trademark songs, so this is an old teacher. When I go by Baltimore, got no carpet on my floor. Come along and follow me, we'll go down to Galilee. Green, green, rocky road, promenade in green. Tell me who you love, tell me who you love. Little Miss Jane, run to the wall. Don't you holler, don't you call. Don't you call, no, don't you shout. When I sing, come running out. Green, green, rocky road, promenade in green. Tell me who you love, tell me who you love. See that crow way up in the sky? He don't walk, no, he just flies. He don't walk, no, he don't run. Keep on flapping to the sun. Green, green, rocky road. Promenade in green. And tell me who you love, tell me who you love. Tell me who you love, tell me who you love. Tell me who you love, tell me who you love. Dave Enro. street singer who was uh, actually brought up in North Carolina and uh, Reverend Davis wound up with his wife Annie in 
the South Bronx, just out of a hovel is where they live, basically. Um, later on, uh, Reverend Davis is able to buy a house in Queens because uh, of the royalties that uh, he got from Peter, Paul, and Mary did one of his songs, Samson and Delilah, otherwise known as If I Had My Way. I wound up taking a few lessons from Reverend Davis and driving him around to gigs and stuff like that. He was, he was great. I mean, if you've never heard Reverend Davis, do listen to him. He's one of the great musicians of the 20th century, as far as I'm concerned. It's a different kind of style, um, but uh, he was just a, an, an enormous talent. Uh, Reverend Davis taught me this song called Candyman. Candyman, been here and gone. Candyman, been here and gone. Candyman, been here and gone. Do anything in this god mighty world to get my Candyman home. Candyman, salty dog. Candyman, fattening hog. Candyman, salty dog. Do anything in this god mighty world to get my Candyman home. Run and get the pitcher, get the baby some beer. Run and get the pitcher, get the baby some beer. Run and get the pitcher, get the baby some beer. Run and get the pitcher, get the baby some beer. Run and get the pitcher, get the baby some beer. Run and get the pitcher, get the baby some beer. Wish I was down in New Orleans, sitting on the candy stand. Candy man, been here and gone. Candy man, been here and gone. Candy man, been here and gone. Do anything in this god of mighty world to get my candy man home. Little red wagon painted green, 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 little red wagon painted green. You stop on the red and you go on the green, don't you mess with Mr. In Between. Been here and gone, Candyman. Been here and gone, Candyman. Been here and gone. Do anything in this god of mighty world to get my Candyman home. They rediscovered all these great country blues artists. Um, one of them was Mississippi John Hurt, and uh, that's John Hurt behind me. Uh, we actually got to be very close. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Stefan and I uh, uh, went out to California, and uh, we played at the Ash Grove. We added a third uh, uh, person to our band, uh, it's a 17 year old kid by the name of Ry Cooter, and we called ourselves the, uh, the Gramercy Park Sheiks. And uh, we were staying at, a, at an apartment, uh, the act before us was Mississippi John Hurt, so John had nothing to do for a week, so we wound up living together for a week, and, and we, I got to know John really well, and what a wonderful person. What, and uh, if you had never heard of John, you should listen to Mississippi John Hurt also. I'm going to do, uh, this is working, isn't it? I mean, I hate to think that there's like naked women on the <laughs> You know, somebody's playing a trick. Anyway, this is, uh, this is, uh, my, my, uh, this is dedicated to Mississippi John Hurt. This is basically, I'm just doing, the, this is the beginning, the folk music part of my career. And also, it was a very beautiful part of, of the history of American music, American folk music, was being able to live in Greenwich Village at the time and, and hang out with some of these people. Um, very humbling, actually. 
And uh, so this is uh, John Hurt's Richland Woman Blues. I'm not, if this is if I bore myself, I, I, it's a book I'm reading. <laughs> no, no, when you get to be uh, my age, our age, whatever, it's nice to have this over here, you know, most people are doing that now. I can't afford one of those teleprompters where you don't see it. Anyway, from Mississippi, John Hurt, um, Rich Lane Woman Blues. Give me red lipstick and a bright purple rouge, a shingle bob hairdo and a bottle of booze. Hurry down, sweet daddy, come and blow your horn. If it gets too late, sweet mama will be gone. Went to the fashion shop. Your own sweet mama wants a brand new dress. Hurry down, sweet daddy, come and blow your horn. If it gets too late, sweet mama will be gone. And every Sunday morning, you ought to see me go. My wings spread out, the preacher told me so. Hurry down, sweet daddy, come and blow your horn. If it gets too late, sweet mama will be gone. Well, the roosters say, a cock a doodle do. And the rich girls say, any doodle do. Hurry down, sweet daddy, come and blow your horn. If it gets too late, sweet mama will be gone. So there was a bunch of us in the village that, uh, that my age and you know kids around 17, 16, 17, 18 years old, um, and we wanted to play music together. Uh, but a lot of us, half of us, were doing country blues, and the other half were doing old time year blue, bluegrass music. So a common denominator that we found was jug band music. And um, so we, we put together a jug band. We called it the Even Dozen Jug Band in hopes that 12 people would finally show up instead of the five or 25 that would come. You know, it's very loose. We're all in school. And, and uh, so we started this jug band. Um, this is uh, our first, one of our first rehearsals at uh, Victoria Speedy's house. She was an old country blues singer, actually a jazz singer like Bessie Smith. And she had her own record label and we signed with her. And then Electra bought out uh, the, the, uh, her, her uh, country. So this is the 
album that we did uh, for Electra. We only did one album. Um, and uh, Maria Muldor was on here. And uh, John Sebastian, I'm in the back with my washboard. David Grisman, the great mandolin player. It's a pretty, actually it's a pretty good album also. This is the Memphis Jug Band, and when I did uh, the uh, Take Your Fingers Off It. And that was from our album. And I'm gonna do another, I'm gonna do another, uh, Memphis Jug Band song. This again was also on uh, the Even Dozen Jug Band album. Oh yes, this is the Jug Band at Carnegie Hall. Uh, we played Carnegie Hall twice actually, and that's me uh, playing washboard. Um, you can tell me later whether you think I gained weight or not. <laughs> uh, well, some I gave an interview like a few months ago to some radio. Guy calls me and gives me. He says, "Do you still have long hair?" And I said, "Yes, <laughs> one." <laughs> Never even put the neck bone into the pot, she's on the road again. Lord, natural born easement on the road again, she's on the road again. Lord, natural born easement on the road again. I went to my window, my window was locked. Went to my door, you know my door was cracked. I will back back, I got my boots. <laughs> nah, 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 Let's try that again. I went to my window, my window was propped. I went to my door, you know my door was locked. Stood right back, I shook my head. A great big rounder in my folding bed. I got my gun. I shot through the glass. I never saw a big old rounder run so fast. He's on the road again. Lord, natural born easement on the road again. He's on the road again. Lord, natural born easement on the road again. to my house, puts down his hat, he says to my wife, where is your husband at? Well, I don't know where they say he's in the pen. Come on, mama, let's get on the road again. He's on the road again. Lord, natural born, he's been on the road again. He's on the road again. Lord, natural born, he's been on the road again. Okay. 
like to meet my father. <laughs> Thanks, I really needed that. I was a nervous wreck to begin with. Will you please let me continue my show? I mean, I, oh, oh, okay. Well, you are, actually. Um, but I'm going to give you a little taste of, uh, of the rock and roll part. Um, uh, we had a big hit with Blood, Sweat, and Tears called Spinning Wheel. Okay. I'm going to play you my guitar part. Just, I hated Spinning Wheel, by the way. And I'm going to play you my guitar part to Spinning Wheel. back in those days. And I said, hey, if you had to play that six years straight every night, you'd be taking a lot of drugs also. Okay, getting back to the show. What you're seeing um, back there is the third, you know, first was the Folklore Center, then the Gaslight Cafe, and this is a place called the Kettle of Fish, which is, they were all like lumped together. The Kettle of Fish was like the bar on McDougal Street for folk music people. Um, it was sort of like the White Horse Tavern where Brendan Bean and Dylan Thomas drank themselves to death. But it was for folk music people to drink themselves to death. And um, I would get, when I was taking lessons from Dave, I would get a call every now and then. And, uh, oh God, I have to tune. Get a call from Dave when I got when I had my uh, I got my junior license, and he would say, "Can you get your parents' car tonight?" And I would say, "Yeah, what's happening?" You know, I'd say, "Can you? We want to hang out." We usually meant there was one night in particular with uh, Dylan and uh, Phil Oaks, and um, as the, these guys hung out all the time. Um, we want to go hang out with. Uh, you know, at, at record uh, uh, record company offices, you know, get stones. Sure, yeah. So we would go, and uh, I would pick these guys up, and uh, then we'd go down to the Gaslight on McDougal Street, and uh, we'd, I just show you, and um, everybody would would jam, you know. So I, I was, it was the first time I, I heard Dylan do Mr. Tambourine Man was at, uh, at the Gaslight. And with John Sebastian playing harmonica with him. And, you know, and then Dave would play, you know, and everybody would, would be uh, playing and jamming. And, uh, and then next door, after the gaslight was closed, we would go to the Kettle of Fish, which was the bar. Um, and sit there with my phony ID and uh, Dylan would talk about how he was doing concerts in the south and you know which was like so weird because of his politics and everything but he was like going over really well and Dave would look at Dylan and wish he was on Dylan to write a song um, called The Kettle of Fish. And it's about those days and about my being a kid and hanging out with these guys. And uh, I changed some of the uh, uh, names. Um, I'll be signing you know, records, CDs out, out there and, and talking to people. So if you want to know who was who, you know. I don't know why I changed them, but I changed some of the names in the song. So while you purchase my new album, I can tell you, know, I'll, I'll answer anything you want. If you don't purchase my new album, screw you. <laughs> um, 
So I wrote this about the kettle of fish. And you do want it to be in tune. Well, the sawdust smelled so good to me, and the whiskey poured like rain. There was an orange glow in the New York snow, with the laughter and the pain. And kids said, Sam, when you become a man, there'll be a new day coming on. Play guitar for yourself, don't you mind the rest, they'll be here, but they'll be gone. I knew Sam who was a Marxist and Phil a soldier too and I remember all the ideals but we drink to the revenues and there was one who made it lucky and there was one who took his life but there was drink to cloud confusion for the kid who did survive it's the kettle of fish tonight We'll drain by the candlelight And talk of wars and greed and tours And the power and the might It's the kettle of fish in circles By a drunken village dawn And the crowd grows thin as the sun pours in And all my friends are dead or I knew Tim, who was a wobbly, and we drank to the fifty years. From coal mine fights to garbage strikes, how laughter turned to tears. And when the waiter said, hey, Tim, let's go, you drank too much for now. We trade songs in a local cafe, and the kid was in. My feet were cold like the sawdust, and my eyes were red with tears. Like the country blues with the morning news, there was conflict in the air. And are you happy writing songs of love as you watch the dawning light? But you'll miss the walk to the beer and talk in the kettle of fish tonight. It's the kettle of fish tonight. By the candlelight, and talk of wars and greed and wars, and the power and the might. It's the candle of fish in circles by a drunken village dawn, and the crowd grows thin as the sun pours in, and all my friends are dead. a little bit, but I'm, I gotta go back before I get into the rock and roll, the electric years. Um, I was talking about the Skip James before, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this is a Skip James song, Crow Jane. <laughs> Jane, Crow Jane, why do you hold your head? 
it so high Someday, baby, you're bound to die I'm gonna get me a pistol Forty pounds of ball I'm gonna shoot my crow Jane Loney Just to see her fall Crow Jane, Crow Jane why do you hold your head so high? You know someday, baby, you're bound to die. Will I dug her grave with a great long silver spade? You know ain't nobody gonna take my crow James place. Well, I lowered her down. With a great long silver chain With every link I would call Miss Crow Jane's name Crow Jane, Crow Jane Why do you hold your head so high? Someday maybe you're bound to die Well you don't miss your water until your will runs dry I didn't miss Crow Jane long Until the day she died Crow Jane Thank you. Thank you. Where we? Oh, yeah, well this is a picture of uh, Stefan and myself, Stefan Grossman um, I keep pointing to that and uh, that's me in the middle. Uh, I didn't gain any weight. I mean, you can be honest with me. And uh, on the right is Ry Cooter, and he was 17. Okay, so uh, after we came back from California, uh, it was like 1965, and things were starting to change in the village. I had to uh, do a, a, a paper was due uh, at some point. I was an English uh, lit major at uh, C.W. Post College, and a paper was due on uh, Yeats and the Byzantium poems. I don't know if you've ever read Yeats's Byzantium poems. No, well, don't. It's, uh, I mean, they're short, but they really will. Yeah, I've never gotten through them, actually. I was supposed to do this paper, but I fell asleep every time after the first two sentences. Anyway, so I had to do this paper, but meanwhile I was teaching on the weekends at a place called Fred and Instruments on 6th Avenue in the village. And uh, a friend of mine, this, now this is 65, Bob Dylan had played the Newport Folk Festival, and he played it with electric instruments. So all my friends, all my folk music friends were running up to Manny's and trading in their acoustic guitars for, uh, for electric guitars. And uh, so a friend of mine, who Danny Cal was his name, who was also taking lessons from uh, Van Rock at some point, um, came up to Fred Instruments, his rhythm guitar player had left, and he wanted to know if I would join his band, which was a Chicago blues kind of band. And I said, Danny, I can't, uh, you know, I, I only can play an acoustic guitar. I mean, I've seen electric guitars, obviously, but I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to use it. I wouldn't know how to do the dials or the chords. I don't, I know nothing about an electric guitar. He says, well, come on up to the Night Owl, which is the place that he was playing, and we'll uh, put a, a, a pickup on your guitar. It was called a DeArmond pickup. And just play along, you know, it's, it's simple songs, you know, like High Heel Sneakers, Muddy Waters, and stuff, which I knew anyway. So I said, okay, I'll give it a try. So the next day, I go up to the, uh, the, uh, the Night Owl, and we, we put on a, the arm and pick up, but it was on 10. I didn't notice that. And then we plugged it in to the amp, which was also on 10. So this huge roar, this horrible, like a herd of rhinoceros is coming to, to attack me. This sound was just like, it scared the shit out of me. I just didn't know, I mean, it was like really frightening. So I turned, of course, you know, then after my first or second acid trip, it was like, I loved it. But that, that's, that's another story. Uh, 
in my book, by the way. Which, uh, and uh, so uh, what I did was I turned my volume down to zero, and I sort of faked playing. But Danny came up to me afterwards and said, geez, I really like you, the way you play. <laughs> he says, we got a gig next week, right? You want to join us? I said, sure, why not? You know, so I think it was outside of Massachusetts somewhere, and uh, I mean, outside of Boston somewhere, and I just loved it. There I was on stage playing with other musicians, and I just loved it. So what happened was, was that I got rid of my, um, my guitar, got myself an electric guitar, bought myself from some bell bottoms, and started to grow my hair long. Of course, it only went, it was only growing long on one side. That's a whole other story also, you know, like trying to get the, uh, the other side to catch up with it. This is, you know, like puberty or whatever it was. Anyway, so, uh, so there, there, you know, and I, and I got myself a, 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 a hippie British girlfriend who was fabulous. And I started smoking grass. And it was like, this is, I love this. I want to do this for the rest of my life. This is fantastic. So this was the point in my life when do I do Yeats's Byzantium poems? Do I, do I do a turn paper? Or do I go out and have a great time, you know, with my band? That was actually the watershed moment in my life. I made a decision, and that's why I'm here today. You know, my, my parents wanted me to be not just a lawyer or a doctor. My parents wanted me to be a lawyer and a doctor. And maybe the pressure was too great. Anyway, I decided to go into rock and roll. So Greenwich Village at that time, then we were playing at the Night Owl Cafe, and the village was so different, where you had the, uh, the, the Galois, and the scent of Galois, and espresso, and incense, and stuff like that, and, then, and now you walk down the streets and you just smell pot, and, and kids were coming in from New Jersey and, and Long Island, I mean, the places, this poor little Italian neighborhood was being, like, it was all the, the, the people that were coming in, and um, they wanted to find out what all the fuss about was about. And the fuss was about rock and roll. All of these uh, coffee shops and uh, uh, were turning into rock and roll palaces. So you had, like, the Cafe Bazaar had the Love and Spoonful. We were playing at the Night Owl, um, along with the... Uh, James Taylor and the Flying Machine, and Jerry Jeff Walker and Circus Maximus. Around the corner was the Cafe Wa. Well, there was, there was the, uh, the theater where the Fugs were, uh, were playing. And then next to that was the Cafe Wa, where Richie Havens and uh, Jimmy James, who then became Jimi Hendrix, were passing around the basket. This is what the village was. It was incredible. And this was the, this was the time that uh, that changed everything. So people talk about Woodstock, and you no, know, it wasn't. It wasn't that. It was a Saturday night on, on McDougal Street in the village in the summer of '65. That was the most incredible thing to live through. Anyway, so we called ourselves the Blues Project. Um, that was our first album behind us. We signed with this really awful record company. We made three albums in our short-lived two-and-a-half-year career, and uh, the record company hardly gave us any money to make records. So the first one was live at the Cafe of Gogo, -Go. and then we did a studio album, uh, which I'll get into in a second, but the third album was also live, except it wasn't. It was done in the studio, and our record company put applause underneath the yeah, I know. Anyway, this first album, um, Live at the Cafe of Gogo, -Go, uh, we, we were once uh, playing at the Gogo -Go and um, our drummer's foot pedal broke. And uh, so somebody had to go up and do something while the foot pedal was uh, changed. So I just came up, I just walked over to the uh, mic and sang was one of my favorite songs at that time. And of course you know this song, but I still think it's beautiful. And um, so we put it on the, on the album. 
in the chilly hours and minutes of uncertainty I want to be in the warm hold of your love and mine to feel you to take your hands along the sand Ah, but I may as well try and catch the wind When sundown pales the sky I want to hide a while behind your smile And everywhere No, Eric Burden's waiting upstairs. <coughs> so we have to live with it. <laughs> anyway, um, I started writing songs around this period. And 
And that's why the music was so fresh and wonderful and probably, and of course we're all influenced by, by the Beatles and lyrically by Dylan, but you know, that hasn't really happened since. Um, and I'm not being, you know, like sounding like an, like an old fart or anything, that, but, but those were the days. Anyway. We were experimenting, basically. We were kids experimenting and coming up with some great stuff. Um, the second album, Projections, I started writing, like I said. I wrote a song called September 5th, and um, we were on the road, and uh, our, our, our manager uh, got a phone call from the record company. Our manager was a moron. And uh, he got a phone call from the record company, and the record company said, Jeff, we have the, the, uh, the tapes, we have the artwork, but we're missing the name of the second song on the first side. Jeff goes into Second song, first side, second song. Oh, that's Steve's song. Thanks, Jeff. I get off the road, and I look at the, the album cover proofs, right? And it's, I, what the hell is Steve's song? I'm looking at this thing. Did we do a song called Steve's song? Oh my God. That was our record company. Could you imagine having that, you know, having, having that, you know, Madonna or something like that? You know? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing to have to live with that. Like, you have a dog or a cat, you know, cat dies, dog dies. You remember it, you know, you, but you get another dog or a cat. I have to live with this for my whole life. People coming up to me saying, didn't you write Steve's song? Yeah, I'm Steve. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to go out on the road and play again for audiences. A big factor is, uh, is, is uh, that I want people to know that I would never, ever write a song with my name in it, you know, on it, I mean, named after myself. So I just want you to know for the record, it's actually called September 5th. On my new record, I have it, uh, I put it on, and I, had, I said Steve's song, but parentheses September 5th, so people would know what it is. But... Anyway, we did it with the Blues Project, and it was like, you can't call me from the snow white star. Let's stay away drums, bass, and the whole thing. Um, I'm going to play it for you the way I actually wrote it. So.
our single where there's smoke there's fire that was one of our we had some really nice um, posters this was we opened Avalon Ballroom uh, in San Francisco and this was the first Avalon Ballroom poster it's in the graduate you know in a window and stuff like that and, and uh, it's sort of like a famous uh, poster our opening act was the Great Society as you see um, with Grace Slick and uh, then she left to join uh, the uh, Jefferson Airplane. Is this working, these slides? I have no idea. Oh, okay, good. Um, okay, well, forget the slides then. No, no, no I'm just... <laughs> um, if you want to throw things there, not here. <laughs> These are some of the posters that, uh, that was at the Matrix. That's also at the Matrix. This is one of the one where we, when we played the Fillmore, and our opening acts were John Lee Hooker and Jimmy Reed. I love that poster. And uh, this is uh, at the Fillmore also. Our opening acts were the Mothers of Invention and Can't Heat. It's another beautiful poster. This is a, a, a blues project, greatest hits, even though we never had a hit. Um, and that was Al Cooper and myself were the popular ones. So they, this is a German album cover. You know, you could never guess, right? That it's... Uh, this is this is the, the the Murray the K show. Look at the people that were in this show. It's the first time Cream was in America, first time The Who was in America. And uh, the open to the uh, headline acts were Wilson Pickett and uh, Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels. Um, special guests, the Rascals, Simon and Garfunkel, Phil Oaks. It was amazing. And hardly anybody showed up to this thing. But we had such a great time backstage, you know. With Wilson Pickett and Eric Clapton, you know, like jamming and stuff like that. Um, it was just pretty amazing. And then we would go down to the village, and, and uh, I'll never forget, I, I went down with Ginger Baker once. Ginger Baker, the drummer from the uh, Cream, from Cream. And uh, we were in the dugout and getting drunk, and he was really getting drunk. And then we walked over to Gertie's Folk City, and now there's like a, a NYU buildings, but then it was just a field. And Ginger and I are walking over, and all of a sudden he stops and bends over and throws up. And I said, I ran over and I said, are you okay? And he said, aren't we going to another bar? <laughs> I didn't know about this quaint British custom. <laughs> is, as, as any of you have tried this, you know, when, I, when you cut bangs, and you just don't get, you, get it, you don't get it right, so you have to cut it a little bit more until it's right, until it goes up and up. Okay, before I get into that, we were, like I said, we were at the, uh, the uh, house band at the Cafe Ogogo. There was one afternoon I came down for rehearsal. Nobody was there except the owner, Howard, and uh, I go into the bathroom and uh, I'm standing at the urinal and uh, I hear the voice of Bobby Kennedy talking to himself in one of the stalls on a Thursday afternoon. I'm saying to myself, what is Bobby Kennedy doing down here? Talking to himself in a stall in the bathroom. So I run out to the owner. I say, Howard, Bobby Kennedy's in the stall talking to himself. And Howard says, no, that's David Fry, the comedian. He's your opening act tonight. <laughs> the impersonator, right? But David Fry's specialty was Richard Nixon. Now, could you imagine if I walked into the bathroom and heard Richard Nixon and Robert Kennedy in the same stall? 
I would have been traumatized. I wouldn't even be here today. <laughs> okay, so the Blues Project live at, um, at Town Hall, that was our last album, and this is where they put applause um, behind uh, our studio tracks. And, it, and I'm going to digress for a second, because I, 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 I uh, produced three albums with Lou Reed. You know who Lou is. Um, and uh, I sort of like messed around with applause myself because uh, the first album that I did with Lou was a live album called The Rock and Roll Animal. And uh, it was right after I left Blood, Sweat and Tears. And we took the tapes from the Academy of Music. It was a live album. Now in those days, you didn't have digital delays, so you had to have stereo applause tracks, two stereo applause tracks. We were missing one of the tracks. Took the tapes back to RCA, and uh, somebody stepped on a cable or something. So I said to Gus, what are we gonna do? We can't have the applause in mono. And he said, well, let me run it, let me, let me go to the archives. There we were at RCA. Let me run into the archives room and see if I can find a, a tape of an audience applause. He runs and he comes back, I got it. I said, oh great, we can just run it in. He says, yeah. I said, what concert is this? It says, John Denver concert. <laughs> So, <laughs> till the day Lou died, he didn't know that his best-selling album, half the applause was from a John Denver concert. <laughs> Not only would it have killed him, but it probably did. <laughs> so we're getting somewhere. This is the Blues Project, ex-Blues Project star. This was uh, the first um, Blood, Sweat, and Tears album, and uh, this is the cover, which was very unique for its time. Now you can do all this stuff with Photoshop, but we had our, our own, you know, our heads on our... That's the original, the kids. These little models, these little bastards that had to sit on our lap and kept complaining. I'm going to sing uh, at least one song from uh, this album. Uh, that's Lou Waxman. He was the recordist at, uh, on, the, on our first album. Lou, also, his job was to just press play and record, you know, mix it. He's cha changed tapes and stuff like that. It was just like a tape op, you know, very simple. He was, he was union, but it was very simple. And uh, his job was also to uh, to get lunch for everybody, you know, put in orders, you know, usually to the to the Carnegie Deli. I mean, he did this for the New York Philharmonic, for every act, you know, that was recording for Columbia Records. One day, uh, we're doing mixing, and Lou erases a mix of one of our songs. Half of it's gone, so we have to redo it. He was, like, devastated. This was his job. His job was going to be lost if anybody found out. He was crying, he was in tears, and, uh, and we just, we just, Lou, don't worry, it'll just take a few hours, we'll redo the mix, just calm down, we're not gonna tell anybody. I said, really, really guys, you're gonna let me go on this? Yes, Lou, we'll let you go. Oh, thank you. Anybody want a sandwich from the Carnegie? Uh, you didn't get that, did you? Okay. Okay, this is Lou Waxman. Okay, so the first Blood, Sweat, Tears album. We did this, we did this album in two weeks. I did two songs, one of my own, but what I'm gonna do uh, now for you is uh, a song I did by uh, my old friend Tim Buckley. I lit my 
like your candle close to my window, hoping it would catch the eye of any vagabond who passed it by. Before he came, I felt him drawing near. And as he neared, I felt the age of fear. That he had come to wound my door cheer. And I waited in my fleeting house. Tell me stories. I called to the hobo Stories of old I knelt to the hobo Stories of cold I went to the hobo And he stood before me and my fleeting house. No, said the hobo, no more tales of time. Don't ask me now to wash away the grime. I can't come in cause it's too high a climb. And he stood me Then you be damned, I scream to the hobo. Leave me alone, I wept to the hobo. Turn into stone, I knelt to the hobo. And he walked away I lit my purest candle close to my window, hoping it would catch the eye of any vagabond who passed it by. And I waited in my I'm actually turning pages here because I'm going to do something for you that's relatively new for me. Woodstock uh, with John Sebastian, Happy Traum, um, J. Unger, Molly Mason, and it was based on the Harry Smith uh, folk anthology of American folk music, uh, which Harry Smith, uh, who was this whole beatnik, put together all of these 78s, and it was very popular in the 50s, folk music. I mean, everybody had to have one if you were a folk musician, and uh, so everybody was going to pick uh, a song from the anthology, and do that to this benefit. Um, by the time it got around to me, there was like, there wasn't that many, I mean, I figured, you know, there were Blind Willie Johnson or Mississippi John Hurt or something like that. But no, the only thing that was left was, was King Kong Kitchi Kaimio, which is the first
drug you into court. And I've been doing it since, and I just love doing it. Um, I may have to read a little bit, but uh, I hope you enjoy it. This goes back to the medieval ballad. I mean, it's one of those children's songs about violence and death. And no, it's not that bad, actually. Our first. 
first the uh, blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> yeah, getting back to this is what we opened for Cream at uh, Winterland, um, and this is backstage at Winterland when we opened for Cream, and it's clamped in a nice smoking joint. Oh no, I shouldn't be showing that. Um, this was uh, what we looked like. Uh, blood, sweat, and tears. The first blood, sweat, and tears. Um, which is pretty frightening. Uh, our singer, Al, looked like a hostess Twinkie. <laughs> this is a, a concert we did in Detroit in that first promotional tour, and uh, our opening act was the Psychedelic Stooges, Iggy and the Stooges. Okay, well, so, my parents uh, didn't talk to me that much when I when I left here. Yeah, no, no. <coughs> they they didn't talk to me that much at all until our first single became a hit record. Then my mother called me and she said, "Stephen, we knew it all along." <laughs> Thanks, Ma, but I can afford my own pot roast now. <laughs> So this is um, uh, my contribution to the second uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears album, which had all the, the big hit singles on it. And uh, there was another, I, a lot of my songs are about unrequited love. Um, I never wrote like blues or up-tempo things. It was always ballads. And um, I found that when a woman walked out on me, I would like write a song because I was so sad about it. And after a while, I sort of like uh, encouraged this because I would get royalties, you know. So. I'm leaving you, Steve. Great. I'm going to have a shot of whiskey and smoke a joint and write a song. Anyway, this is my contribution to the uh, second Blood, Sweat, and Tears album. Sometimes in winter I gaze into the streets and walk through snow and city sleet behind your home. Sometimes in winter, forgotten memories remember you behind the trees with leaves that cry. window once I waited for you laughing slightly you would run trees alone would shield us in the meadow making love in the evening sun now you're gone girl and the lampposts call your name I can hear them in the spring of frozen rain Now you're gone, girl And the time slow down till dawn It's a cold room And the walls ask where you've gone
cover before, um, uh, before they put our faces on. And I put this on here because it's, it was done by the Quay Brothers. The Quay Brothers are fabulous. They're, they're great artists. Uh, they're video artists and, um, and also uh, whatever this is. Anyway, uh, the Quay Brothers are in the, they're British twins. Uh, they were born in America. Um, and this actually is in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art as a Quay Brothers thing, without the faces. Evidently, from what I understood, the Quay Brothers got really pissed off at Columbia Records for putting our faces on. That's the Fillmore uh, the Electric Factory in Philadelphia. There's all kinds of... So we won, um, with all the hit records and everything, we won uh, three Grammys and a whole bunch of awards, Downbeat, Playboy, all these things and um, that I, I don't have anymore because uh, Allison, my wife, said, uh, they're just collecting dust. Can you please get them? Meanwhile, I've got a house full of ceramics and talking about collecting dust. But this is... <laughs> Jeff understands. Um, but the, uh, this is when we won Album of the Year and it was, uh, the Grammy was handed to us by Louis Armstrong which is one of the highlights of my career, my life. That's a, a dust collector. I don't know where it is, somewhere in the house maybe. This is, this is an interesting chart. Um, this is when we had number one single in Cashbox, which was then When I Die, written by Laura Nero. Uh, if you look at uh, not 9 and 10, um, by Eli's Coming by Three Dog Night and uh, I think Stone Soul Picnic, um, by The Fifth Dimension, um, Laura Nero had three songs in the top 10. Aside from the Beatles, this was like unheard of. And um, that's when her manager, David Geffen, went into Columbia Records and said, you know, we own your publishing company, basically. And that was the beginning of Geffen's career. They still give you these things with cassettes. That's a, that's a quadruple platinum record that's hanging somewhere in my kitchen, my broom closet. This was an anti-war um, uh, concert that we did. Um, you can see well, great people here, like Harry Belafonte and uh, Dave Brubeck, Judy Collins, Jimi Hendrix. Richie Havens, The Rascals, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Well, I might as well tell you the story now. Um, I was very political then. I held these, uh, you know, these concerts. There was a moratorium, um, there was a moratorium march against the war in October of 69. And it was gonna be in New York City and Washington, I think San Francisco, but it was a major anti-war thing. I was very anti-war, I was very leftist at the time. I hated the Nixon administration. I, I um, um, was very active against the war in the Nixon administration. And we were booked, we, we had you know, tons of hit, right? we, had, we, were, we, were, we were booked solid. And it was about a month before uh, the march. It was an incredible time in New York because the, the Mets were in the World Series with the uh, Baltimore Orioles, first time the Mets were in the series. And, um, it, and, and this moratorium march was coming up and, you know, against the war. So it was an amazing, another an amazing time. And we were booked the day of the march and I said to the, uh, to the uh, band members, we had a band meeting, and I said, guys, I love the band, I love you guys, I love the music, you know, but uh, um, I, I, you have to, I can't make the gig because I have to march. Um, I have to march against this war. As much as the music and you guys mean to me, being against this war or marching against this war means more to me. And so you can find a sub, you can cancel the gig, you can fire me. Whatever you do is fine, I understand, but I am marching that day. 
The night before the march, I get a phone call from a friend of mine. I've got an extra ticket to the game tomorrow. <laughs> he Mets won it in extra innings. It was fantastic. <laughs> I got to see my friend Ron Swoboda out and make that incredible catch. And, uh, anyway, it should be a shame. <laughs> this is, uh, my glasses on. This is, uh, one of these. Bill, uh, this is like uh, Fillmore East when Jethro Tull opened for us. And there's the Allman Brothers opened for us. Which was an interesting night because Leonard Bernstein decided to bring his two kids to, to Fillmore. And he went into the, he wanted them to meet the Allman Brothers and came into our dressing room. And I was there alone changing my pants. And there's Leonard Bernstein and his two kids. Well, my, and I didn't wear underpants. <laughs> this is when we played Las Vegas, and uh, I have a, a, a little caption uh, under this. This is it says counterculture. What counterculture? Miles Davis opening for us at Madison Square. It's funny. I mean, Miles is Miles. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, Woodstock, it's coming up, I hated Woodstock, I wore white pants to Woodstock, and we drove in, we drove in, we, we had to wait backstage in the rain for like, you know, for hours, and uh, you know, thank God the guys in the band and Crosby, Stills, and Nash had some some great dope. Otherwise, I, you know, I was ready to slash my wrist. Anyway, um, so there it was Woodstock. Uh, then we got out of there. But I, we played Monterey Pop Festival when I was in the Blues Project, and that was fantastic. That was a great festival. I got to shake um, uh, uh, Rodas's Redding, Rodas Redding's hand, and. Um, I uh, saw Janis Joplin from the side of the stage to Wall and Chain. It was just beautiful. And I had dinner with Jimi Hendrix backstage. There was a hot dog stand. <laughs> and me and Hendrix and the guy in our band who knew, uh, who knew Jimi, we had hot dogs. My book, uh, you know, when they promoted my book, I don't know if it says anything on there, but they, you know, in the promotion they said, and he jammed with Jimi Hendrix. I never jammed with Jimi Hendrix. I shared a bag of potato chips <laughs> with Jimi Hendrix, which I think is much hipper than jamming. Everybody's jammed with Jimi Hendrix. How many people have shared a bag of potato chips mm. with Jimi Hendrix? Well, here's the, the case scale of Woodstock. I don't know if, if you, it's been on the internet, but we were the second highest paid act. And then you look at down the list that Santana paid got $750. That's uh, the, the, the hit Blood, Sweat, and Tears on stage. And uh, somebody just, uh, I just found this photograph. Um, uh, this is like, uh, like fabulous, but I mean, this is really what it looked like and felt like. I was wearing um, a, a shirt, a short sleeve shirt that had those yellow and blue stripes. And the lead singer, David, uh, who, who I never got along with, you know, we were really tired and, uh, you know, we were on the road a lot. And David referred to me to, in front of 10,000 people as a Jewish bumblebee. <laughs> so I went for him in the dressing room. <laughs> Nothing happened. Um, this was uh, Apollo 14 or something like that. It went to the moon. And uh, this is this... Uh, particular astronaut took his favorite songs with him on cassette. One of them was Sometimes in Winter, which I just played. Um, and uh, so a song of mine has been in the mood, on the moon. And a friend of mine um, um, said to me once, uh, oh, that's great, it's been on the moon, did they leave it there? I said, no, he says, no, that's nothing. <laughs> This is a 
pretty amazing. Our third album was number one that week. Now look at the other albums. Woodstock was second, uh, Dylan's self-portrait, and Let It Be by the Beatles and Who Live and Leaves. McCartney, Creedence Clearwater. Pretty amazing. That's uh, in Eastern Europe, um, Zagreb. Um. This is on our fourth album, uh, a song that I wrote called Valentine's Day. And um, The reason I've been doing this is uh, a couple of years ago, we lost uh, Lou Soloff, who was um, a trumpet player and uh, one of the two trumpet players in Blood, Sweat and Tears. Louis was also a fabulous jazz player and very beloved by everybody who knew him. And um, Louis did a solo on uh, Valentine's Day. And just before he, he died, we were gonna jam at a club, but he couldn't make it, you know, because he, he called me up and he says, um, hey, do you mind? I got a pain gig tonight. I said, no, take the pain gig, you know. But Louis did a, a beautiful trumpet solo on this. There's a trumpet solo plus a piccolo solo on top of it. It's another song about the woman leaving the nest. Yesterday, the many ways you looked into my eyes. Seems so strange for all the many years together Sitting by the window Couldn't move you if I tried I've been standing on the outside here forever Candles lit an empty room Where you and I last talked And a bed made warm by seen a thousand highways, walked a hundred roads, but for you I know there'll be many others. Oh, let the wind blow and strike me to my knees, I'm forever getting sad and lonely. Oh, let the sun glow shine upon the trees you'll forever be my one and only darkened holes and hotel walls will keep me in disguise while your brown eyes look for what you have forsaken better times so uh, far behind me, I can't quite forgive Calls for all that you have given, you have taken Saddened by a country tune, I cried myself to sleep Woken cold by footsteps softly I have seen a thousand highways, walked a hundred roads, but for you I give you freedom to believe in. Oh, let the wind blow and strike me to my knees, I'm forever getting sad. Forever be my one and only.
sad in my country too I cried myself to sleep, to sleep Woken cold by footsteps soft Seen a thousand highways, walked a hundred roads, but for you I give you freedom to believe in. Thank you. It's Alice Cooper and my mother. <laughs> I want to do this for an encore, but <laughs> that's the, the Lou Reed. Okay, now, who's the guy on the right? He was a fan of Blood, Sweat, and Tears, so we had a picture taken in mind. Who was, does anybody know who the guy on the right is? This is unbelievable. Go on, go on. This is, I, I'm so ashamed of all of you. The guy on the right was the first man on the moon. Neil Armstrong. Oh my God. Okay, so I went through some years of production and uh, then wound up, uh, I was asked to produce a band uh, that was going to be put together with uh, Doug Ewell from the Velvet Underground and Craig Fuller, who was in Pure Prairie League. Um, they did Amy, Amy, what you going to do? And uh, I said, well, I'd rather be in the band, you know. And uh, so we, we, we got together, called ourselves American Flyer. We added Eric as great songwriter who did Love Has No Pride. And, uh, Bunch of stuff for Bonnie Ray wrote it, and um, we did an album for. Uh, it was like a, a bidding war for uh, for the labels, and uh, the person who won was an old friend of mine, Al Feller. And even though we had a smaller label called United Artists, we went with them because Al said, "Well, what can we do? We don't have the money that Columbia or RCA has. So what can we do to sweeten the pot?" I said, "You can get George Martin to produce us," and that's exactly what. To do. Did. And so, uh, if you don't know who George Martin is, he was the Beatles producer. And uh, one of the most beautiful people in the world, one of the most talented people in the world. So during the making of our American Flyer album, we'd run around after George saying, how'd you do this with the Beatles, and how'd you do that with the Beatles? And learned a lot. He was amazing. I wrote a song that I had done with Blood, Sweat, and Tears early, years earlier, but it came out like a, we never put it on an album because it came out like a funeral dirge. And, <clears throat> excuse me, George beetled it up a little bit. So I'm gonna end with this, uh, you know, um, we're now up to the end of my, well, not the end of my career. <laughs> not the end of the evening. And thank you for coming. Cinda and Michael, who have been just wonderful to me, and um, and uh, Lynn who, uh, from the Warner Theater. And there's my sister-in-law sitting there. <laughs> she didn't leave. <laughs> um, and so I leave you with speaking of which. That's my, my lovely wife, Allison. Sweet little girl, you're a candle in a cold, cold world. And I'm the lucky one, afraid as I am. A child, I need your body close to mine, and friends for life ain't easy to find. I
you can only be a man for a woman who gives you love, and treats you good, gives you everything she could. And back in '57, I believe in heaven someday. Back there with the books.